O God, who by the passion of Christ, your Son, our Lord, abolished the death inherited from ancient sin by every succeeding generation, grant that just as, being conformed to him, we have borne by the law of nature the image of the man of earth, so by the sanctification of grace we may bear the image of the man of heaven through Christ our Lord. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance, and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see. Those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured, while we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the shearers, he was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny? when he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people. A grave was assigned him among the wicked and a burial place with evildoers, though he had done no wrong nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked. And he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses." The word of the Lord. Spirit. 
of reproach, a laughing stock to my neighbors and a dread to my friends. They who see me abroad flee from me. I am forgotten like a reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Please be seated. Jesus went out with his disciples 
across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus and the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with him. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am, so if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink that the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized him, bound him, and brought him to Anas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside, so the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid who was the gatekeeper said to Peter, You are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made, because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me, heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there, keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was morning, and they themselves did not enter the praetorium in order not to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? 
They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said, indicating the kind of death he would die, so Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more, Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now, when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and I have the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and, carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, 
Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic. The tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be in order that the passage of scripture might be fulfilled that says, they divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clophis, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother, and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. Please stand. Now since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they may be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first, and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you may also come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus. And Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and also weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus, bound it with burial cloths along with the spices, according to the Jewish burial custom. 
Now, in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day. The tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the Roman Empire, crucifixion was a normal form of execution, reserved for the worst offenses and criminals in the ancient world, usually only slaves and those who fomented rebellion would experience this horrific death that was usually measured in days, not hours. In the course of the long history of the Roman Empire, Hundreds of thousands of crucifixions and executions took place. During the famous Spartacus Revolt in 71 BC, the Romans crucified over 6,000 slaves, placing them upon regular intervals along the road between Capua and Rome, a sign to any other slave that would think of rebelling against the status quo, what would be awaiting them. These 6,000 slaves that rose up against an unjust system and lost experienced a similar brutality unleashed against Jesus. They were murdered for standing up for their dignity as being human. However, their sad fate did not change anything for the salvation of humanity. They were only regulated to a dark footnote in the overall history of the Roman Empire, a few thousand deaths more at an empire that directly caused millions. Fast forward in history about a hundred years to around the year 30 AD, and the Roman authorities of Jerusalem crucify a Jewish man on a charge of claiming to be the rightful king of Judea for upsetting the status quo of society. The soldiers mock and beat their captive during his trial. They led him in a humiliating procession through the city, carrying his own instrument of death, and they nailed him to a cross just outside of the city, completely nude to heighten the level of mockery. And that is how our Lord Jesus Christ died falsely accused, abandoned by most of his followers, except the blessed disciple John and a band of three women, including his mother Mary. Jesus upon the cross, naked and gasping for the ability to breathe, every breath more labored than the last, until finally bowing his head and handing over his spirit. Viewing this crucifixion, most of the crowd gathered that day would have seen a routine execution, a just execution to protect the harmony of the city and to punish those that blaspheme against the one God and his laws. However, nothing about this crucifixion was routine or normal. The passion of our Lord Jesus Christ upon the wood of the cross was the farthest thing from normal. It was extraordinary and that the man who hung upon that cross was the Son of God and from the moment of the Incarnation by the power of the Holy Spirit and the humility of a young Jewish girl in Palestine, God became man and now dwells among us. And in a mysterious way, God himself was bound to all humanity from that moment, the creator and the creature becoming united. 
the master and his workmanship. Only through the divine second person of the Holy Trinity and his passion can our suffering become united with his. He blazed a trail, and if we follow it, life and death are made holy and take on a new meaning. In total obedience to the Father, in love for all humanity, Jesus Christ took the sins of all humanity upon himself and reversed the disobedience of the first Adam and upon the wood of the cross defeated the last enemy, death itself. No longer is our suffering without meaning. All of humanity has the ability to be united with Christ's suffering. Our suffering now has the ability to be united to his on the cross. Now the patient suffering in an ICU ward, struggling to breathe, is united to Christ in his suffering. The medical professionals dealing with the high risk and stressful situation of working in such an area, Christ is there. The pain of racial inequality throughout our world, Christ is there. The crushing cycle of social injustice, Christ is there. The person who has lost their job and now struggles to make ends meet, Christ is there. Any activity that degrades the human person, Christ is there and the wrongful termination of the human person from conception to natural death, Christ is there nailed to the blood-stained wood of the cross, experiencing their pain with them, loving them until the end, taking it all upon his bruised shoulders and raw back. You are not alone. The love that Christ has for humanity his obedience to the will of the Father is ultimately what allows him to enter into the suffering of his passion, which he fully experienced in all its pain and brutality in his human nature. On the cross, the last battle was fought, the first sin corrected, the image lost regained, the throne of grace erected, the portal of mercy open to all. This is why the sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon the cross was completely different than anything before it or after. God united himself with his own workmanship out of complete love and experienced the totality of the human condition in everything except sin so that he could be fully bring meaning to our suffering and grant eternal life to those open to his mysterious grace. Now, life and death are made holy and take on a new meaning. No matter our suffering, no matter our sin, Christ is there if we but turn to his love demonstrated upon the wood of the cross. Christ the fullness of revelation, the self-revelation of the Trinity, gives us a model to follow as Christians. Solidarity with those that suffer through love and complete obedience to the divine will. We do not have to suffer alone, for we have a God who is for us, a God who will never abandon us, and a God who died for us so that we might approach this throne of mercy and grace and enter into eternal life. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world.
Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord is pleased to give her peace, to guard her and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Almighty, ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy, that your church spread throughout all the world, may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name, through Christ our Lord. For the Pope, let us pray also for our most holy Father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you, their Maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith, through Christ our Lord. For all orders and degrees of the faithful, Let us pray also for our bishop, Gregory, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed. Hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully through Christ our Lord. For catechumens, let us pray also for our catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that, having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty, ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism they may be added to the number of your adopted children, through Christ our Lord. For the unity of Christians, let us pray also for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth, to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Almighty, ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. For the Jewish people, 
Let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. For those who do not believe in Christ, let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ that, enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Almighty, ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart they may find the truth and that we ourselves being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world through Christ our Lord. For those who do not believe in God, let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Almighty, ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest, Grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you. And so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. For those in public office, let us pray also for those in public office that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Almighty, ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and freedom of religion may through your gift be made sincere and secure, through Christ our Lord. For those in tribulation, let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Almighty, ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, May the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, 
that all may rejoice because in their hour of need, your mercy was at hand through Christ our Lord. For the afflicted in time of pandemic, let us pray also for all those who suffer the consequences of the current pandemic, that God the Father may grant health to the sick, strength to those who care for them, comfort to families, and salvation to all the victims who have died. Almighty, ever-living God, only support of our human weakness, look with compassion upon the sorrowful condition of your children who suffer because of this pandemic. Relieve the pain of the sick, give strength to those who care for them, welcome into your peace those who have died, and throughout this time of tribulation grant that we may all find comfort in your merciful love through Christ our Lord. For an end to the pandemic, let us pray, dearly beloved, for a swift end to the coronavirus pandemic that afflicts our world, that our God and Father will heal the sick, strengthen those who care for them, and help us all to persevere in faith. Almighty and merciful God, source of all life, health, and healing, look with compassion on our world brought low by disease. Protect us in the midst of the grave challenges that assail us, and in your fatherly providence grant recovery to the stricken, strength to those who care for them, and success to those working to eradicate this scourge. Through Christ our Lord. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world.
Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world.
whose command informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may all have a life unceasingly devoted to you through Christ our Lord. Bow down for the blessing. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord. 